let's uh, discuss a different topic for today. Let's start a different topic, which will keep us busy for uh, several classes about uh, web technologies. Okay. Um, what or why are we discussing this, or what has the web uh, to do with ambient, with ambient intelligence? Actually, we need to understand a bit uh, how the web works and what are the web languages for two different reasons. One is uh, providing user interfaces. So I want a user to go on a website and see their data and to set their preferences or whatever. So I need to be able to uh, create a, a small website with some functionality. Uh, also, for mobile applications, maybe we need to create a native application, but in many cases, also a website uh, navigated for the mobile could uh, do the job equally easily. Okay, for providing user interfaces. But uh, there is another, maybe more hidden, but uh, probably more important uh, uh, reason, is that uh, um, web technologies are also used to interface and to interact among devices. So if you have two computers, you will see that, or one computer manages one sensor and the, and the other manages another device, and you need to exchange data or commands between the two computers, how do you do that? Do you use your own protocol? Do you open a socket and send commands? Do you use, do you use a serial line or whatever? No. It turns out that today, the best way, the most efficient way, especially for prototyping, is using web technologies. So for us, the web technology will be used also to deliver information and comments between different parts of our system. You remember that when we discussed the general architecture, no, the, we call that the system architecture of the of the um, of the of the project, and it will be something that you need to to work on for deliverable number two next month. Uh, we identified one or more computing nodes, and these computing nodes needed to to exchange information. So web technologies are one very easy way of implementing this exchange of information in a way that is asynchronous, robust, concurrent, parallel, and whatever. So we exploit a set of technologies that was designed for web interaction, for websites. We are exploiting them for uh, integrating distributed systems. So one way of uh, creating, managing distributed systems on web technologies. Hmm? So uh, we will start first, first from the surface, not from the external side. We'll have a look up on how the web works, and then later, in the, the later weeks, we'll see uh, how to exploit these technologies for, let's say, application to application integration. And so we will be able to create our own client server applications using web technologies. Um, so, uh, first of all, I want to spend some time in giving an overview on how the web works. So, those of you that already know about uh, HTML and HTTP and JavaScript and uh, what these names mean, can go to sleep uh, for the next hour. Uh, but since from the, the survey, for the initial survey that we did, uh, we saw that a lot of people didn't have any, say, information about this, uh, I think it's better to do a bit of of history and overview, no? just to, to give you, to, to explain you how a website is working. Next week, we'll see how to create our own websites in Python. But for today, uh, we'll not do any programming anymore. We just try to understand how different pieces are put, are put together. So understanding these web technologies for creating user interfaces, and later we'll see how to, these technologies are used to create uh, distributed applications. And we see that uh, creating distributed application mainly relies on understanding better and using better the HTTP protocol, that for user interface is very easy to use, but we need to understand it better. And on top of the HTTP protocol, we will uh, develop uh, what is called the REST 
So uh, set, um, um, as a methodology for creating distributed functions using HTTP. Hmm? I, I can't uh, say that in three words, so uh, we will need to wait until the next week. So let's start uh, with uh, what happens when you click on a link, when you browse the web, when you open a browser. A lot happens. Uh, the web is not the web is not a single technology. The web is a set of technologies. I saw, I found this website that uh, gives us a sort of an overview of the web technologies as we know them today. So this is a timeline. Okay. Uh, it's not very updated, it goes up to 2012, but it dates back uh, to 1990, 1991, okay? So you were, at the, in those years you had, had different uh, problems to manage, uh, but we are 25 years uh, uh, from now, the first uh, uh, elements of the web were invented. And actually, we see that the first two, every, say, every snake or every ribbon of, on this picture is a different technology. It's a different standard or a different language. At the very beginning, they were two, the HTTP protocol and the HTML language. They were too, and they still are. HTTP is still here today, somewhere in this jungle, okay? And also HTML, in, in, of course, in later versions. The web was born by this couple of two technologies, HTTP and HTML. Uh, what is also shown in this picture is the adoption of the different browsers. So you see that, uh, sorry, there are, for example, for HTTP, how to read this diagram. For HTTP, we see that uh, uh, the, I can move the mouse, uh, otherwise it will deselect the picture. But uh, you see that here, there was a browser called Mosaic that in version 0 0.1, supported HTTP, version one, and so on. So every time, uh, these black lines here are the browsers and their versions. Version one, two, three, four of Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer was designed in 1995. And every time a snake, a ribbon, crosses a browser, it means that that browser started supporting that technology, okay? So you see the HTTP uh, was supported in version one of Internet Explorer in 1995, six. And we go further, maybe HTML4. HTML4 was defined here, and it was 98, but it was supported by browsers only much later in 2003, and the first one was Safari and then Firefox, for example. Okay, so uh, one, Aspect are the different technologies, different languages, and the other is a support that different browsers have for these languages. <laughs> but what's happening? Let's try to shrink this picture a bit. It happens that uh, new technologies every now and then are added, SVG, okay. CSS, events, touch events, uh, web audio, HTML5 should be somewhere here, and so on. So you see new snakes joining the party. You see no snake leaving it. So it means that today, in order to work in the web technologies, we need to have a knowledge of all the technologies that were invented in the last 25 years. Not all of them, 
many of them because all of them are joined in a way to create what we consider today a modern web page. So a modern web page is delivered with HTTP, is made, is written in HTML, four or five or XHTML, depends. Its layout is designed with CSS, version two or three, depends. Its dynamicity is given by JavaScript, of course. It may have interactive elements that come from a BHTML video and audio or uh, the animations. It can interact with the uh, web servers uh, asynchronously thanks to this HTML HTTP request object, uh, which is an addition to JavaScript with, that is used by all websites today and so on. So mm, I, I, <laughs> I cannot count them on the fingers of one hand, they need two hands, to count the number of languages that we need to understand even a single web page. So what I want to do today is try to understand the role of the different technologies. So if, if you see at this part of the picture, uh, probably you want to run away, because it's too complicated, it's too, the, there's too many technologies, I will never be able to manage them. So what I will try to do is to try to break them down and to understand, um, let's say, historically, how they were added one by one, hmm? and to understand why and what they do, just to understand how they fit. And then the next uh, lectures, the next classes, we'll try to build our own application, starting with the basic technologies and then adding uh, what we really need. Hmm? We, we don't need... Uh, to create the next uh, Facebook tomorrow morning, okay? So maybe we don't need everything at the beginning. But uh, just imagine that, say, I want to be a web programmer, doesn't mean I want to learn one program, one, one programming language. Huh? It means uh, learning an environment made of different tools, different languages, different standards, and mastering most of them. Hmm? So it's um, a nice uh, word. Web technologies. The web is made uh, always of two different computers that exchange information. A client and a server. A browser on my computer and a server in California or Helsinki or wherever it is. I don't know. Or maybe in my office. Uh, these two Items are linked by internet. So I draw this as a triangle, so a pyramid, it depends on whether you have a 3D sense. I have a browser that connects to a server through internet. So internet is just seen as a transport network, some way of letting my computer to connect to your computer, to your server. The web technologies actually the web standards describes what happens here in this interaction between the browser and the server. The issue is that for the server to do something useful, behind the web server, you need to have some additional software. A web server is just able to respond with static pages, but you need some application code, really code that does what you need that knows what your website is doing, and for sure at least a database server that holds the data uh, that your system is managing. So we have a lot of different levels. When you, when you click on a link on a browser, and the browser will show you the, la I don't know, the last um, Facebook message from your friends, or the, la the last uh, Gmail message from your mail uh, interface, that information were, was, maybe two seconds before, stored in a database. And then it will be painted in your screen in a, in a specific place. So that information has to travel through a lot of different layers. Okay? The web is a, is a layered architecture in which every layer depends on the layer below it, exploits the services of the layer below it, and that's every layer, layer has the, different technologies. The database server 
to be managed it requires an expertise in databases, database administrator, optimization, and so on. The application server means uh, programming an application. There you have uh, Java programmers, uh, Python programmers, C Sharp programmers, .NET programmers. The browser level, you need JavaScript programmers and CSS designers. So every layer has its own specific technologies and its own specific programming language. All of these should be invisible to the user that just want to click and have their mail displayed. Um, so this is the, the initial model. And just to clarify, when I say a server, uh, let's try to split always in our mind the, the two meanings of the word server. What I mean may be a physical server, so a physical computer, or a logical server. A logical server is a, is a service, no? it's a software that runs somewhere and provides some functionality. There is no precise mapping between logical servers and physical servers. You may have uh, maybe all these three layers, web, application, database, on the same computer, on the same physical server. So web server, application server, database server, three different logical servers on one physical server. Is, if your website is small enough, you can do that. With, with virtualization, you can also have maybe 50 different web servers on the same com physical computer, on virtual machines. But if you have maybe a very large website with a lot of users, maybe you need uh, 10 physical servers just for the databases. So there will be one logical layer, the database layer, that is hosted, that is replicated on 10, for example, different physical machines because of the load that it needs to handle. And so if you have a lot of contents, you will have your web server duplicated, replicated in many times. You will have 10 front-end web servers, different physical machines that all together implement one single logical layer. Okay, so depending on the load of your web application, there is a lot of flexibility on how these logical levels map to two physical levels. We will care more about the logical levels here, because the physical level is mainly a, syst a system administration issue, not just not, not, not a design or programming issue. And uh, the first level that we meet, the most important one, is the web server. So let's think about a logical web server. What is a web server? It's a very simple program. It started as a very simple program that only does one thing, one job. It manages the HTTP protocol. So a web server is a software that is able to manage one single protocol, communication protocol. HTTP is an application level protocol, which is designed around two different messages, a request message and the response message. So the web server only does one thing in its entire life, waits for request messages coming from different, from remote computer, remote clients, analyzes these requests, creates a response message, and sends the response back to the client that issued the request before. That's it. Everything that the web server does is to wait for HTTP requests from clients and send an HTTP response back to the client. How can the web server know the response to give? Well, there may be two possibilities. The response is already defined, is already a file. When, you're, when you have a link for downloading a PDF or for downloading an image, the web server just has to take the name of the file and encode that into HTTP and send it back to the client. 
So the response is already ready on the computer, on the server computer. One possibility. The other possibility is that the response doesn't exist yet and needs to be generated dynamically. When you click to see the new tweets on your Twitter time stream, uh, there is no file in the world that already contains the list of tweets that will be displayed to you. That list needs to be computed for you in that specific moment. The web server doesn't do that. The web server says, okay, this is a dynamic content. I don't do dynamic. I can't handle dynamic content. I delegate to the application server, so to the layer below, the task of generating dynamically in this moment this content that is needed. And then I, web server, will send the content back to the client. Okay, so the, the idea is that the client, you click on a link or write an address. What happens is that your computer, let's say, maps the, the, the click to a single string, to an address, no? the URL, http slash polito.it slash whatever, okay? That is the unique address of a web content. The first part of the address is the name of the server. www.polito.it means the server, the logical server, polito.it. The rest is an internal path of the resource that you want inside the server. So the first part, the host name, is used by the client to contact the web server. The second part is used by the web server to locate the resource, the file, that you need, and then send it back. The message exchange is just wrapped in two very simple formats, huh? formatting messages, that are called the HTTP request, the request is the message from the client to the server that explains to the server what, do, what they want. The uh, response message is a message from the server to the browser on the same TCP IP connection containing the, the resource, the file, that has just been requested. Two details. First, there is one new, there is one TCP IP connection for every HTTP request and response pair. Means that when the web server sends the response back to the browser, it can close the connection. It forgets about you immediately. If the client needs another page, another image, another file from the same web server, the client will need to open a new connection at the HTTP level and wait for the response. The web server has no way to correlate the two requests. If I am requesting the same browser on the same computer for the same user, two different documents to the same web server, in the same millisecond, I would say, they run as two different connections, and the web server will treat these two requests as completely different. This is the great idea, one of the great ideas of the HTTP protocol. The HTTP protocol does not have any memory. One request, I respond, and then I forget about you. There is no conversation, there is no memory. I can, for me, it's the same serving 100 pages to the same user or one page to 200 users. For me, there are 100 different requests. I don't need to know anything else about this requ the request, where does it come from, who does it come from, or whatever. I don't need to know, to know anything to be able to do my job, give the response. So it's a very simple protocol, and this is why 25 years later we are still using version 1.1 of the HTTP protocol. 
uh, that dates back to 20 years ago. Now they're starting to think about version two, but you know, something that doesn't change the version, you don't need to change it in 25 years, it's a very rare piece of technology. Okay, that was the first thought. One request, one connection, after the connection is closed, I forget about you. The second strength of the HTTP is that the web server doesn't need to understand at all the content of the file that it delivers. The file would be probably an HTML page. The web server doesn't understand HTML. The, the, the content could be an image, a JPEG, and PNG, a GIF. The web server doesn't understand it. It doesn't need to read to, to understand the format. Maybe a PDF, I don't care. It's just a file. It's just a bunch of bytes. Hmm? So the web server is, if, if tomorrow a new type of encoding videos or images comes out, we don't need to change one single line in the web servers. It's already working because the web server doesn't care about the format of the resources that have been transferred. Who cares? The browser. The browser must display them. Once I have a file, the browser must show it to the user. So the only element of this architecture, for now, that cares about the format of the files being transferred is the browser. That needs to understand HTML, understand PDF, understand PNGs, understand GIFs, understand audio files or whatever to show them to the user. Okay? So we have a very strong separation of, of responsibilities. The web server being so simple and being based on a so simple protocol is very easy to be robust, fast, and scalable, and can be used in many different contexts. Okay. Um, of course, the web server doesn't know, but in most of the cases, the basic content being transfer transferred, okay, uh, from the server to the browser are web pages. And web pages are written in the HTML language. So HTML is a description language. If you want, in five minutes, you can go to the website and it gives you the basic uh, information. Uh, and it's a formatting language. So language in which you describe the content of a page by using uh, special tags. Tags are commands uh, enclosed in less than uh, greater than signs. Um, let's show an example. For example, you are probably familiar, we don't know, with this web page, okay? The web page of the course. We call this a web page. It has an address, a server part, the computer in which the logical server in which this website is running, and a resource part. So the internal path on that computer where this page is stored. Let's forget for now that it's dynamically generated. Let's imagine that you have one file describing this page. So what's in this page? Well, text, basically. Text, some images, some links, and some layout. The fonts are bigger, smaller, this uh, box is on the right, and so on. All of this is described in the HTML language. And HTML is not a secret. For every web page in the world, you can always view page source. View the source of the page. So this is actually the content of this web page that we were looking one second ago, uh, being transferred from the server to this computer. I just opened it in this moment. And you see HTML is a language, okay, 
let's skip uh, all the, let's find some uh, uh, de deliverable one. We have this word deliverable one here, so it should be present, okay, here. Uh, deliverable one, okay? So you see that I have some text here, which is part of a, of a bullet point list, which is just after a title. In HTML means that this line is an LI, LI stands for list item, an item in a list, and this list is part of an UL, unnumbered list, unordered list, a list with no numbers, so it will have bullets. And this list comes after latest news that is an H2, heading level two. Heading level one is the big title, heading two is smaller, heading three is much smaller, and so on. So all the formatting instructions are given in forms of very simple text. P is a paragraph, means okay, go to the next paragraph, like pressing enter. A is a link, means that this text is a link to this address, to this other web page. So when you create a link, the past edition is available at this archive page. At this archive page is the text that becomes a link to this actual web address. Okay, so when you go here, you see the text as this archive page, but uh, when you click on it, uh, it will go to this, to that address, and so on. So we don't, we don't want to, to spend time now in uh, seeing the, the list of HTML tags, but actually the, the list of tags in HTML for starting is just maybe five or 10 different tags. Uh, for in the part of the list, the title, the link, uh, an image, okay image somewhere, you guess EMG is an image tag with the source of the file containing the page, the, the, sorry, the image file. So this is the logo, this image here. Okay, so this is the language in which all web pages are described. What happens is that, uh, so imagine that when I click on this link, to get to this page, my browser has just sent a request message to the server somewhere in my office. My server responded with this HTML page. Let's see what happened in reality. So we can open up, if we go to, this is, uh, it's, um, in this case it's Chrome, but uh, also Firefox and Internet Explorer has the, have the same functionality. There are some developer tools. And these developer tools, uh, why does it put it here? I want them below. Okay, doc side, bottom. Okay. Uh, there's a part of the browser that helps me to, to debug the content of web pages. And what I want to see here is that there are different uh, aspects. We will come to the different parts here. I want to see the network. The network tab uh, traces all the information exchange between the browser and the server. So let me reload this page. So here the bot, okay, we, do, we, have, we have this page again, it's the same as before. But if we have a look below, we see many different HTTP requests. The first one is actually the page that I requested, this one. The other ones are additional requests that are uh, 
you know, you see that they, these are the timeline in which these requests happen. These requests start, start after the first one has been loaded. What, what is happening here? It's happening that the first request gave me the HTML file. The HTML file has a lot of uh, images, has a lot of uh, scripts, uh, has a lot of uh, icons, has a lot of uh, um, style sheets, scripts, and so on. Every graphical aspect, image, uh, font, style, layout instruction, every interactive element, menu, drop down, and whatever, uh, doesn't fit into the HTML file. HTML is not, the language HTML is not powerful enough to represent images, uh, animations, layout, and so on. So what do we do? We link into an HTML page external files that add functionality. So for example, for providing this icon here, the, the lamp, the, the yellow lamp icon, we say that this, in this, to this HTML file, we link this fav icon, favorite icon. And when the browser reads the HTML, the browser understands, oh, I should show this image here. But I don't have this image. I need to make an additional request to the server for getting that file. So every time in an HTML page we have a link, a script, uh, an image, and so on, it means a font. It means that the browser needs to make additional requests to the same server for getting the additional elements. These elements may be style sheets, may be scripts, later will be uh, images, logo, arrow, dog, and so on, other images. You can see them, all the images that are part of the page. Some small, some big, but all of this information. So, whenever you go to a web page, that page will generate one plus many requests. One, the first one for the HTML code. And then a, a lot of additional requests for every graphic, graphical element that you have in the page. And this, of course, adds up to time. So for loading one page, the HTML was already ready in 400 milliseconds, but the whole page took more than three seconds, three and a half nearly. So 10, 10 times more, because you don't just have, don't have just to, tra to, tra to transfer the HTML. Okay, so one, um, one page, many requests. Many requests, for every request, one different request and response messages. And how do these request and response, response messages look like? Let's have a look at the first one, the HTML page. So this is the request, the initial request that started everything. The... Um, actual message that my browser has sent to the server is here, is this one. Uh, my browser has sent one message, the, what we call the HTTP request, that contains one line called get with this address. So the HTTP request is just a message of one line, writing get, which is a command, and then the address, so the, the, the resource of the page that they want. Additionally, 
the browser send to the server some additional information. So I want that page, that resource, but I want that in a text HTML format or in XML format or in WebP format or in any other format that you have. So the browser, say, it tells me to the server which are the formats that the browser will, is able to understand for displaying the resource. And if you, if you want, the browser is telling to the server, if you want, you can encode the response by using gzip or deflate or any or some other compression algorithm. So if the response is big and you want server, you can compress that with gzip because I, the browser, I am able to decompress it with that algorithm. So I'm the browser is declaring the capability of itself to the server so that the server can adapt the response for that browser. The language, I would accept English as a first choice, 08, or Italian as a second choice, 06, or anything else with preference 04. So if you have this resource in English, give me that resource in English. Otherwise, give me it in Italian. Otherwise, give me what you have. Uh, this sort of, uh, it's called content negotiation. When the browser requests information, give the preferences about which is the form in which this information could be given back. If the server only has one form, okay, it gives that form. Otherwise, we'll try to find the best matching one. And for example, other user agent. User agent is a string in which the browser introduces itself to the server. Okay, server, I am a browser Mozilla 5, Windows NT 10, Apple WebKit, Chrome 49, Safari. It's a bit of schizophrenic browser because it's actually Chrome. But it also tells that it is Mozilla and it is also Safari. Uh, browsers use tricks in order to be accepted by, by servers or in, in theory the servers could adapt the rendering of the page depending on the browser. But uh, from these strings, you can understand what kind of browser is visiting your website. <coughs> and so on. So this is the, you can imagine one line with, uh, what is that? Get, name of the resource, and then the string HTTP 1.1, followed by this uh, set of uh, headers that we show. We show here in the real, uh, in real time. So when you, I click on a link, my browser co creates a small text file with this content. This is the request part of the HTTP protocol. Then just opens the TCP connection to port 80 on that host and sends this packet on that connection. That is the request. Very simple. Just, you know, 90% of the information you need is, is already in the first line. Get, not slash, but in this case it will be get uh, uh, index PHP, teaching current courses, and so on. And this is all the information that the server needs to respond. Then, what the server does is to create, to retrieve the HTML and respond with some response headers. So the server says, okay, the request you made is okay. So the first line, again, is a protocol version response code. So in the request is command get resource, protocol version. Command is get in 90% of the cases, post in 8% of the cases, and something different in the remaining 2% of the cases. The response is protocol version. So I accept this protocol version, maybe a, user, a, a, version, a different version from what you requested. 
never above, but maybe below. And then the response code. Response code is made of two strings. One is a number, and the other is a string. Is the textual version of the same number. 200 means OK. 404, you know it, means page not found. 500 means server error. Uh, you see these, uh, these messages uh, from time to time. So every request, if, if it's uh, satisfied by the server, the server will reply, 200, OK. I have the response for you. I have the response and not generating an error. And the response is made of two parts, headers and body. Headers are some information that the server says, says to the browser about the current request. For example, content encoding gzip. You remember that the browser said, I'm able to understand gzip if you want to use it. And the server said, okay, yes, I use gzip. So the content that I'm giving to you is compressed with gzip. This is the date. I'm giving this content in this specific date. So you know when you save it, when it is uh, when it's being uh, delivered to you. Uh, the server name. This is the version of the server, the web server, that runs on this version of the operating system. So every, every time you click on a link, but not just every time you click on a link, for every single request in this long list, you will have an exchange of headers. Request headers go to the server, and the response header come back. You say, but it's useless because you already say the same thing one second ago. Because if I keep a, a request down the list, you see that the request headers are the same. Because the browser is always the same. It will repeat the headers any time. Okay? And the response will be more or less similar. The server will be always the same. We see it's strange because we see all these requests being correlated, being part of the same page. From the HTTP server point of view, there is no notion, no concept of a page. They are just different requests. They just happen to be similar, but the web server doesn't realize it. That doesn't realize, that doesn't really care if they are similar or not. It doesn't even look for the similarity. Okay, we said the response is made of two parts, a set of headers and the body of the response. And the body of the response is, guess what, the HTML code. Or maybe the JavaScript code. Or maybe the CSS code, depending on the specific request. Or the image, uh, sorry. Okay, oh, these are images uh, that, that are not shown here. Uh, you need to go to preview and not to response. Okay, sorry. Okay, so this is what happens when you click around. Every time you click, you are generating a storm of requests. The first one for getting the HTML, and the other ones for getting the additional information. Every request is packaged in a small message that goes from the client to the server, with headers. Get name of the request, headers. The server receives the message, composes a response, creates a response by adding some response headers and a response body if the resource is found, if there is no error. Then there are mechanisms in some way for minimizing this. Uh, I have 59 requests but for this page. But if I reload this page now, so I click again on this link, for example, you see that the same page, no, oh, only 58, uh, okay, was, uh, I say, painted much faster, displayed much faster. 
And you see that there are a lot of, of, uh, of these 58 requests that only take zero milliseconds. What happened? It happened that the browser recognizes, not the server, the server doesn't know, doesn't do anything of any of this reasoning, but the browser says, okay, but at this point, I need system.css, but I just asked this file from that server one minute ago. So do I need to ask, an, to ask it again, or can I just reuse what I just downloaded? So the browser keeps a cache, a cache, a local copy of all the files that, that it received from the servers. And it tries to avoid making additional requests to the same server if the copy, if the local copy in cache of the file is still young enough, if still not expired. So before making a request, the local browser checks whether the file is already available here, checks the date of the file, and checks the expiration date of the file. If the expiration date is passed, then the request is asked again from the server. If the expiration date is not passed, then uh, the browser is free to reuse the local resource and so might be much faster. So the first, first time you visit a new website, you need to download everything. Then when you still keep navigating the same website, it will be faster because many of the resources will be already on the browser. And about uh, expiration. Uh, when is a file expired and, which, and when not? Well, it's the server that tells us, for example, in this page, um, where is the line? expires. So when the server gives us a file back, it also, the server sets an expiration date. So this resource I'm giving to you, consider it valid until this date. In this case, you see that this, the expiration date is set in the past. This means that instructing the browser not to cache it, or not to reuse the cache, or request it every time from scratch. In other cases, the server didn't set an expiration date, for example here, and so it's up to the browser to decide whether to request it or not a second time. So there's a mechanism uh, that is embedded in the correct interpretation of these headers of the request and of the response that determine what actually gets transferred. But this is just an optimization mechanism. We should always think about uh, this continuous exchange of messages, request response, request response. In some cases, this cycle will be optimized away because uh, we already have the response, we don't need it. But mm, it's just something that happens, we don't need to be aware uh, of this optimization. Mm, it doesn't impact uh, us as, uh, as uh, web page designers. Okay. So this is what happens uh, um, in the simplest form of web requests. So we are not uh, seeing what happens behind the scenes. What we, are, what we were doing here, we were, we, were, we were assuming that that web page was already ready. So I'm making this picture and I will add items to this picture uh, in, the, in the future. So this is the most basic version. What we have here is a browser. I put here the icons of different browsers to stress that there, is only not, there, there isn't just one type of browser. There are many of them. Most of them do the same thing. They handle the client side of the HTTP protocol. And then we have the web server that handles the, the server side of the HTTP protocol. Here we have the internet. The browser sends HTTP requests containing the address of the resource to the server. The server responds back with an HTTP response containing a file, plus headers, okay. <clears throat> the web server act, uh, 
can read HTML files or image files from its own disks or their disk and sends this file to the browser. What the browser does when it receives the HTML file, it activates a sort of a layout engine that reads HTML and understands the text. Okay, this is a title I should set up in larger fonts. This is an image I should draw it in this part and it takes uh, one third of the page, so you should uh, lay out it there. So there's a lay layout engine that understands the HTML and displays the page in a way that the user is able to see it. The final goal of the browser is to show the content to the user in the most efficient way. Okay, so right now it just has to understand HTML and some layout rules for displaying the pages to the user. And the only thing that the user can do at the moment is to click on some link, and when you click on a link, the browser will start the process again. Create a new request, wait for response, the response will be an HTML, it will be understood, it will be laid out, and all the graphical elements on this HTML will be subject of another request for getting the corresponding image, for example, or layout, or information, and so on. The only thing that we don't know is whether this HTML file was already ready, really, on the hard disk of the server, or maybe it wasn't there, and it has been just created from us, for us, uh, by a web, web, web application. So what happens that in most of the cases, you don't have all the web pages already prepared as a static HTML files. You have a program that will generate the page on the moment. It's much more convenient and efficient. You know, I don't have one page for this and one page for this other part of the page and one page for this where all the menus are the same, all the layout is the same. These pages are very similar to each other. So it's more convenient to have one program that will generate these pages so that we can apply all the layout consistently in all the pages and not having to do cut and paste of the, of the menus, for example, between the different pages. So what happens in reality is that this HTML is never there. Every time I request an HTML file, in reality, I am activating a program that will generate that file for me in that moment. That file is sent by the server to the browser, is displayed, and is forgotten or deleted immediately after from the server side. So the server will create the file for me in this moment which is a unique piece because afterwards it will be deleted immediately. In the, if I reload the same page, another copy of the same file will be recreated. Maybe it's identical because nothing changed in the meantime, okay, and will transfer it again to me. But the browser doesn't have this memory. Okay, so all the complexity that will be for next week is what is this application doing for creating the HTML file, and uh, what are the additional uh, features that these browsers may have uh, in order to improve the layout and the interactivity with the user. That is where the complexity goes. HTTP and web service are actually quite simple. The complexity is below here and inside the browser. Okay, but this is the topic for next Thursday.